Welcome to Love What You Love. I'm Julie Rose. I'm insatiably curious about people in the world around us and absolutely in love with passion and unselfconscious enthusiasm. Every other week, I geek out with someone about the thing that they love, and then I share it with you. Welcome back or welcome. It's that time of the year when the sun is up earlier and earlier, which means you're getting up earlier and earlier. It should be easy to just roll over and go back to sleep, but around here, we have some very vocal birds who insist on a cacophonous dawn chorus every single morning. For this week's wonderfully soulful guest, this is the very definition of heaven. Rachel Evangeline Barham is a professional singer and vocal teacher, and absolutely passionate about all kinds of birds, especially songbirds. In this chat, we talk about bird early warning systems, birds singing badly, different planes of existence, birds with rubies in their tail feathers, blackbirders week, observing versus collecting, and so, so much more. So find out why Rachel loves birding, and why you might learn to love it too. Hello, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, Julie. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so interested in birds, and which is a big change for me because I, I was absolutely terrified of them for my entire life until recently. Really? So, wow. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yes, it's, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but um, So I'd love to know, like, what is birding um, for folks who don't know what it is? And then how did you get into it? Those are two very big and sort of loaded <laughs> questions. Um, what What is birding? Uh, I'm glad you said birding because it's so much more than bird watching. Um, I would say it's observation. Sometimes it means staring at a tree for 20 minutes and waiting for something to happen. Um, but obviously, I think that has some value on its own, on its own. Um, just going out and being being in nature, but sort of tapping into this different plane of uh, of existence. Um, so you're going to see birds, sure. You might be going to count birds, and you're certainly going to listen for them. Uh, that's a that's a dimension that I think is not apparent to everybody. That um, birding by ear, just listening for what they're saying, is huge. It's maybe I mean for me, it might even be the biggest part of it. And then you're also um, you're also looking for their behavior. So birds are sort of a triple threat, right? Um, they're like a, they're, they're singing, they're dancing. Um, <laughs> and, and I, uh, I guess it's, it's singing, it's what they look like, their plumage, their feathers, um, and enjoying them on that level. Uh, and also their, their behavior. So what they're doing, um, I guess that's my, that's my little definition of birding. How did I get into birding? Um, this is a, it's probably a pretty long story. So I guess I have to say, um, there are two people who really got me into birding. One was my father. Um, he died in 2008 and he was a, uh, a Methodist minister in Mississippi. That's where I grew up. And he was an amateur naturalist in all senses of the word. He loved anything in nature. He was just insatiably curious about, um, birds and bugs and leaves, trees, uh, you know, just all sorts of things in nature. And I know that he did specifically teach me about some birds. And I can I can talk a little bit about that later. Um, he was always telling me and my brother, you know, look at this, look at this, listen to this. Um, and uh, so I think that was part of it. I also think I inherited a lot of his personality just naturally. So if he had not specifically told me about some of these things, I'm pretty sure I would have come there on my own eventually. Um, and then my brother, I, I, I'm trying to pin down the year, but somewhere somewhere around the time that my, my father passed away, um, my brother and I kind of seriously got into birding. He's, he's my only sibling, and uh, he lives not too far from me. I'm in Washington, D.C., um, and he lives in Virginia. And I would go birding and tell him about my observations and then vice versa, and that was how I ended up figuring out a lot of what I was hearing or seeing. I'd say, hey, I heard this thing and it goes, um, it, it makes this noise. What do you think that is? And he'd say, oh, that's a such and such. So we sort of went back and forth. And I think I have now 
surpassed him in <laughs> bird craziness. Um, not, not necessarily in, in like being better at it or anything like that, but just being a little bit more obsessed than he is. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, I think, I think birds for the two of us became um, sort of an extended, we're, we're not twins, but we're close in age. And we have this sort of twin language mm. where we, um, you know, you make up a language that your parents can't understand. Um, and uh, we, we like, words we like um both of us are musicians as well uh and we like to um kind of imitate the songs of the birds and things like that so i guess those are two the the two dimensions of it um then fairly recently actually so for me for me birding was always an introverted thing it was something i did by myself and i would report my observations to my brother and i would do report some of them to a citizen science thing but it was sort of a thing that i did on my own. It was a solitary activity um, that I need very much as an introvert to get away from people, sort of restore myself. And uh, and about, I think it was about 2017, um, I discovered, I, I guess I just started going out to a different place where there were a lot more birders around. Um, so it wasn't just me. And uh, I got in with a group of, of people who are just as obsessed as I am. Um, and I, I have now kept up. There's a little bit of a social element to that. We have a little chat thing where we talk about our observations and things like that. Uh, and I'm now connected to some major, major birders. Um, I, I am, I should say this up front, I'm an amateur. This is a hobby for me. It's not something I do professionally. And there are people who have degrees in this. I'm not one of them. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so it, it has recently become a little bit more of, a social activity, but now I still have to have my introvert birding time. So I'm kind of birding a lot these right. days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh my gosh, there's so many questions. What is a typical day of birding like for you? That's a good question. It depends on the season. Um, right now, so it's it's late April here. Uh, and so I, late April until late May is uh, in, in D.C., in this area, is the height of spring bird migration. So you have not only the resident birds, they're here all year or here most of the year, but you have these um, little birds migrating through that are only here for sometimes a day or a week, or th that's, that individual may just be here for a day, that species may just be here for a week or two before they move on. Um, and so it's really nuts right now. <laughs> <to go out laughs> there. And uh uh, so I, what I try to do, I do have a few places that I need to drive to, but I really try to do it by bicycle. Um, I think it's it's probably not any secret that birds are facing all sorts of threats, and climate change is a big one. And I'm like, well, why don't I walk the walk and not just talk the talk? So I, I really, um, I know it's not an option for everyone uh, for many reasons, but I try to go to a place that's nearby. Luckily, I have a, a fantastic um, uh, several places to choose from, actually. Um, and so I will uh, get my morning coffee and go ahead, go through all that, you know, and get dressed and everything. I'm not actually much of a morning person. And I usually, um, <laughs> I usually roll in around eight o'clock when the first shift, uh, well, probably the second shift of birders is leaving because in the spring, some people show up at like five o'clock in the morning to see what's out there. Um, you, you do get more of a concentration first thing in the morning, but I can never make it over there unless I wake up in the middle of the night. So, um, and what I do is I try very hard to lock up my bike before I get my binoculars out because if I go ahead and do that, I'm doomed. I'm sitting there like with my bike leaning against me, going like, "Come on, just lock up the bike, lock up the oh, what is that?" <laughs> so that's pretty typical. Um, and uh, that's that would be one of those days where so much is going on that you you literally can't focus your eyes or your ears. There's just like a wall of sound. Um, everybody's singing, and there are typically several other birders out there too. So you see somebody with the, I, I get my bike locked up. I see somebody with their binoculars pointed somewhere, or I see a group of people with their binoculars pointed, and I'm like, oh, what are they looking at? But you never go like running up to him and say, what is it? What is it? You know, there are these, these kind of protocols. <laughs> um, uh, you you try to find what it is that they're finding and you say, oh, you've got a, a rufous-sided toey or whatever. That, that's a 
they've actually changed the name of that bird to an eastern toey, but I like to say rufous sided toey because it's fun to say. Um, so so that's that's sort of how it goes. And then people come and go in waves if you're at a, a spot where a lot of people go. Um, and you know, sometimes I like to just stay there after everybody's left and uh, see what comes down. I think usually by about usually about 10 in the morning, the birds are quieting down a little bit. Um, they're just not quite singing as much. They're, they're dispersed a little bit more. Uh, but around noon, a lot of them come down to get a drink of water or to get a bath. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find a good puddle or a good stream, you got, you got some action going on there. That's going to be great, great bird watching. There's nothing like watching a bird take a bath. It's just so wonderful. Um, I guess that's a typical day, but there are also the days where it's slow for no particular reason. And on a day like that, you really might get to listen to something like a, a concert that a wood thrush is giving you or um, really observe one bird in an individual. And those days are just as good to me. I, I just I, I love both kinds of those days. Is it like collecting or it's an experience, but it's also like cataloging the world? You're right. It is a, it is a little like cataloging the world. Um, and I found I've, I've had the great privilege to go uh, snorkeling a few times. And I found that my brain works in this, this sort of encyclopedic way of classifying animals or nature. I don't know a lot about plants and trees. I, that's something I would like to know. Um, but I, I haven't really had time. There are too many birds. Um, but I, I, I found, oh, that's a, you know, you, you sort of um, group them by size and shape and color, things like that, or by the by the family. I actually don't know a whole lot about the science. I'm really, really more of an observer. Um, but it, so there is that. You want to work on your life list just to say, you know, this is how many species I've seen. Oh, shoot, I should have looked up that number. It's, it's, um, my official count is somewhere around 350, but I, there, there's some old lists I haven't put in, particularly from when I was traveling places. Um, so I know I'm, I'm well over 400, and that's nothing compared to people who go all over the world looking for birds. Um, but I will say that I'm pretty proud of my yard list. I, I'm up to 93 birds in my yard, and this is in Washington, D.C. Um, it's in a fairly... It, it's not an, a super urban part of the city. You would you would look at it and say that's a suburb. You know, there's some everybody's their lawns and sidewalks, um, but we don't have a lot of trees. It's just that we're close enough to uh, to Rock Creek Park, which is one of the places that I like to go. Um, that I think a lot of birds stop in our few little trees on the way to the park um, as they're as they're migrating, and. I've had these things, they just land for four seconds and then they go away. So I just have to be out there in the morning when they when they do it. Um, or it might be a flyover. Like I've never had a bald eagle in my yard, but I've seen them flying over, oh. you know. Um, but uh, you, you ask about sort of collecting and that's um, that's an experience that I don't do it for that reason. Um, but when I have taken somebody on a bird walk with me, somebody who's never done it before, I see that tendency. I'm like, we're not playing Pokemon Go here. <laughs> you know, like, oh, oh, there's a bird. And I'll tell them what it is and I'll tell them a little bit about it. And then they're like, okay. And I see their feet starting to move. I'm like, well, we could we could stay and see if it does anything or see if it sings for us, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so to me, it is more about mm, kind of being still out there and waiting for them to come to me, waiting for them to do their thing. Um, because it's a great privilege when one is pretty close to you and you can uh, really get more of a sense of it than just a, a sighting, just a glance. Now, what do birds represent for you? Do you dream about them? Are they, they have symbolism <laughs> for you? I do dream about birds um, frequently. And occasionally I have a dream that is so vivid that I literally get up going like, oh, I've got to put this in my bird list. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. What's the dream? Um, and I also dream, I mean, I dream vividly anyway, but I, I dream uh, dream birds that don't exist. Ooh. And some of them are so beautiful that I, you know, uh, draw them just for my own personal record. Um, I remember one that had a, it's a small bird, kind of gray. And in its tail were these square 
like cut rubies. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, God, what a great bird. Yeah. <laughs> that I drink that. As far as what they represent for me, yeah, I, I do think they they occupy our world, but a completely different plane. And it's something like this, for me, this connection with that, I'm getting chills right now, this, this plane that they occupy that we will never understand. It's, we know a lot about them. But there is so much mystery um, to where they go, what they do, what their motivations are. You know, we, we will never be able to know all of those things. And I love living in that state of mystery, living in that state of uncertainty about what's this bird going to do? Um, or, you know, who I'm going to go out today. Who's going to show up? What am I going to see? The other thing about birds is we can't control them. I can't any more will a a bird to go away from my house than to come to me. You know, I have these backyard birds that that hang out all the time. I can't will them to come and and sit in my hand. You can train some wild birds to eat out of your hand, but that's not the point. The point is like they do what they want or they do what they are somehow programmed to do. And the mystery of that, that programming that makes a Northern Cardinal sing the same song that every Northern Cardinal sings or, um, or a song sparrow learn a different song from its parents. You know, they're, uh, they're just so mysterious. Um, as much as I know about them, there's always going to be something else to find out and always going to be something to surprise me. What can birds kind of in general tell us about a neighborhood or about an environment? Well, this might be where we need to cue the, uh, the <gasps> audio yes, samples that yes, I sent yes. you. Would you like to hear those? Um, so I, uh, I have, I, I had a feeling you might ask me one of two questions. One of what? One of which would be, um, what's my favorite bird? And of course, there's not an answer to that. But um, I actually, I think the answer to that is which bird is wh- whichever bird I'm observing right now is my favorite. <laughs> bird. Um, so that's the easy answer. But I do have a favorite sort of category of birds, which is birds that imitate other birds in in their singing. Um, now, I am a classically trained singer. That's what my profession is. And I do think I'm probably more keyed into that than most people are, um, just because I'm used to like distinguishing my pitch out of a whole mess of orchestra or um you know, singing my own part, one person per part in an ensemble, things like that. So I think I'm I'm better at discerning the sounds than a lot of people are. Um, so one of my favorite kinds of birds is birds that imitate other birds. And there are several of those, but um, there are three that are in the same family that all live in my area. I, I meant to say birding is... Uh, regionalized. And I know you're on the West Coast. I'm mainly talking about East Coast birds. But if anybody's disappointed that they don't have the birds I'm talking about, just go to your local Audubon Society and someone will tell you about all the cool birds that are in your area that I am totally jealous of. So just, you know, <laughs> there's there's something something for everyone everywhere. So these, are, these birds are called mimids, these three birds. One is the Northern Mockingbird, um, very famous in literature. Uh, one one is the brown thrasher, so that's kind of a cousin of the mockingbird, a large, um, beautiful bird. It's this sort of rusty brown color on top and has uh, spots and stripes on the on the breast. It's really beautiful, striking bird. It looks like a dinosaur. Um, and the other one is a gray cat bird. Uh, I just saw my first gray cat bird. Actually, I just heard my first gray cat bird yesterday. They have come back after going wherever they go for the winter. Uh, so I'm super excited about those. So these are all really great birds that imitate other birds. So if you get to a place um, that has a mockingbird, all you have to do is listen to that mockingbird, and it is going to tell you every bird that it's ever heard in its life, plus possibly some that some other bird heard and it passed it on to that bird. (laughs) Wow. So if you want to play that one, it's it's the first sample, the uh, mockingbird that I sent you. This is actually quote unquote my bird that that inhabits my yard. He's so friendly to me that um my front door is wooden and it sticks a little bit. So I have to kind of kick it to open it. I go out there, I kick the door and he is sitting there on the railing, not scared of anything because he knows me. 
And in this sample, he imitates, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this because I just think it's so stinking amazing. This bird imitates, I think I give you about a one minute sample. But by the way, this was a 17 minute concert that he gave me. Um, he imitates eight birds that I can discern. And of those eight birds, 19 different fragments of song. Oh my goodness. And, and a car alarm. <laughs> so you're going to hear him go rear, rear, rear. And right after the car alarm, I believe it's right after the car alarm, he also imitates a crow, which is my favorite thing. He's like, arr, arr, arr. so so listen to that sample and see what you think about a mockingbird. Is astonishing. So that's one bird. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that is literally a bird who can tell you about uh, everything that's going on. <laughs> well, and so what? why do they do that? I mean, I guess you'd have to ask them, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's their way of establishing their territory. Um, and, you know, the louder you can sing and the better singer you are, the, the more ladies you're going to attract, really. That's sort of the sort of the, um, you know, the crux of that. But uh, by the way, this bird has done, he's imitated two birds that are not on my yard list because I have never observed these two birds. So he must have heard them um, in the middle of the night as they were flying over or something. And I've never seen him, so, but I, but I know the songs. So he's just incredible. So they are, they are just fantastic singers. Um, uh, Hollywood loves this bird. Uh, if you need just sort of a bird song in the background that keeps going, <laughs> they will deliver. <laughs> so that's my virtuoso mockingbird. And sometimes I, I, I almost can't go and look for the, go out in the woods and look for the little warblers and things because I don't want to leave him. I want to hear everything he's saying to me. He's so wonderful. Um, and they are, they are fearless. They'll attack a cat. They attack crows. They're, they're great great birds. Um, so I hope, I wish every, every home had a mockingbird. Um, <laughs> uh, the next one is a brown thrasher. And I have had these in my neighborhood, but they like a little bit more open territory or some woods, some water. So they're a, a little more exurban and um, uh, you'll find them in more um, natural areas, wild areas. But this, this guy is um, and by the way, these are these are all males. Um, for most songbirds, not all, but most songbirds, it's the males that do the most singing. Um, the northern cardinal is a, a notable exception to that. The females, female cardinals, sing as well. Um, and uh, but anyway, so this this guy, um, I actually I only hear him specifically imitating uh, three other birds in this recording. I have a, a lot of other recordings, but I just wanted you to hear the quality of what of his the sounds that he's making. It's not like these whistly things. It sounds electronic or electric or something. They're just um, it's this otherworldly sound. So why don't you listen to the brown thrasher?
<laughs> R2-D2, right? Yes! yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a voice teacher, and I just can't even wrap my brain around how they are physically making those sounds. They do have a different, they have, um, most songbirds have two different vocal org- organs, so they actually can make two sounds at once. Um, I meant to say about the brown thrasher that unlike the mockingbird, he always does he does these short little snippets of songs and he always repeats it so it's this this that that this this that that with pauses in the middle and so you can always tell the difference between those two birds um so I I heard that one last week and I what I'm disappointed in is it was really windy so I didn't get a good recording that was his public concert um where he was uh he was really showing off and trying to say I'm the loudest I'm the best But right before that, for about three or four minutes, he gave me a private concert. Um, I was so close to him that I could hear he was practicing. And it was like half that volume or less. It was maybe a quarter of that volume. And he actually imitated completely different birds in this lower volume setting. It was, uh, I've never heard anything like it. So that that was one of those things where you show up and you don't expect something like that to happen. It was just, uh, just unbelievable. Um, now we have a cat bird and <laughs> a cat bird is called a cat bird because, and I don't think it's on this recording, their call, one of their calls that that's the call as opposed to the song. The song is like what they sing. The call is more like, Hey, I'm here. Or, um, it's, it's just a little, uh, a little note that they make. Um, the cat bird goes, Rawr. <laughs> so they sound like they're mewing like a cat. Um, and the cat bird, um, you know, you know that you know about the singer Florence Foster Jenkins, yes, who was who was notoriously just horrible, but she made all these recordings because she was rich enough to do it. There was a, a, a movie, right, with uh, Meryl Streep. Um, she she had there's a famous quote that she gave. Um, there may have been people who said I couldn't sing but nobody could ever say that I didn't sing. So that's a cat bird. They are imitating other birds. And in this recording that I gave you, I hear one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different birds, but cat birds are terrible. They don't (laughs) sing very well. They're off pitch, um, but they're so much fun to have around. They are just, uh, to anthropomorphize just a little bit, they're just so joyful. Um, so see if you, see if you love the cat bird. <laughs> Not knowing what they're supposed to be imitating, I find them just charming. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they're wonderful. They just um, they just sing, you know. Yeah. Um, I I have a Mary Oliver poem. If you want me to read it, yes. This is um, this is from her collection Owls and Other Fantasies, and I'm going to try not to cry because it's yeah. one of my favorite <laughs> poems called Catbird. He picks his pond and the soft thicket of his world. He bids his lady come, and she does flirting with her tail. He begins early and makes up his song as he goes. He does not enter a house at night or when it rains. He is not afraid of the wind, though he is cautious. He watches the snake, that stripe of black fire, until it flows away. He watches the hawk with her sharpest shins aloft in the high tree. He keeps his prayer under his tongue. In his whole life, he has never missed the rising of the sun. He dislikes snow. But a few raisins give him the greatest delight. He sits in the forelock of the lilac, or he struts in its shadow. He is neither the rare plover or the brilliant bunting, but as common as grass. His black cap gives him a jaunty look, for which we humans have learned to tilt our caps in envy. When he is not singing, he is listening, 
neither have I ever seen him with his eyes closed. Though he may be looking at nothing more than a cloud, it brings to his mind a several dozen new remarks. From one branch to another or across the path, he dazzles with flight. Since I see him every morning, I have rewarded myself the pleasure of thinking that he knows me. Yet never once has he answered my nod. He seems, in fact, to find in me a kind of humor. I am so vast, uncertain, and strange. I am the one who comes and goes, and who knows why. Will I ever understand him? Certainly he will never understand me or the world I come from, for he will never sing for the kingdom of dollars, for he will never grow pockets in his gray wings. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. I think that poem actually introduced me to Mary Oliver, and I was hooked. Um, And I think that actually that sentiment sort of sums up a lot of, you're asking sort of what birds mean to me, like... um, they don't inhabit our world, but they they visit. They're here. Um, and so we can learn about their world by observing them. Um, you know, I'm not super into finding metaphors, I guess, but uh, just just observing them and seeing, embracing some of that mystery that they that they show us if we're willing to just pay attention. Yeah. Now, you, you said there's a difference between a call and a song. Do all birds have a song or do some of them just have a call and the purpose of the song is is a mating thing or is it just because they do? Generally, um, so I, yes, I have been talking about songbirds mostly, but something like a great blue heron um, just goes, Wah! yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so not everything has, uh, I, I think, I think I'm mainly talking about songbirds. That's a good question. Um Um, So an example that a lot of people might know is a northern cardinal. Um, These are the the red birds you see on Christmas cards, you know. But although the the female is beautiful, she's like an olive green sort of with a bright red beak and red highlights all over her, like on her shoulders and tail. She's very, and her her little crest is red, very pretty bird. Um, So their call is like, They're just always clicking back and forth. Cardinals mate for life, um, and they are in constant contact with their mate, saying, here's the best food. I'm over here. Everything's cool. I'm good. How you doing? You know, that's just, it's a baseline. Um, And when they stop singing, it might mean that there's a predator. I mean, sorry, when they stop calling, it might mean that there's a predator or or something something like that. It's like, oh, pay attention. Um, Or if the call speeds up, sometimes you'll hear them go... And that might mean there's a rival coming, there's a, you know, there's a predator or something like that. Um, And uh, the song, they have so many different songs. We actually heard the Mockingbird do several versions of a cardinal song, but it's it's typically um, notated as wheat, 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 chew. So they kind of go wheat, 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 chew, chew, chew. Or they might go chew, 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 chew. One of mine goes Vermeer, 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 beer, 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 beer. <laughs> but basically, it's this ascending thing and then descending thing uh, repeated over and over. So that's a cardinal. Uh, that's the difference in the in the call and the song. And yes, the song is. Um, there, there are probably people who have studied this scientifically more than I have, but I, I think it's generally to establish their territory um, to say if you can hear me then you're too close right, to a rival um, and to uh, uh, to attract females. Or I'm not really sure why the female cardinal sings, um, because I, I guess she's probably trying to attract males. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I also have heard, this is kind of interesting because singing definitely calls attention to a bird, doesn't it? I mean, you that that's it's like saying, hey, look at me, listen to me. Um, I have seen male birds singing very near the nest. So I'm not sure what that's about. If it's a territorial thing, um, when the female's sitting on the nest, the male will be sitting there going, you know, look at me, here's my house. It's bigger than your house or whatever. I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly why they do that. Um, but, but that's another, oh gosh, uh, watching birds build a nest is, it's just got to be the most magical thing ever. They don't have hands and they build, <laughs> right. they build these intricate 
Yes, they're just like master weavers, and some of them decorate too. Um, I watched blue gray gnatcatchers, which is this tiny little bird. It's hardly bigger than a dragonfly, really. It's like not a big bird. They build a nest about the size of a hummingbird nest, and they use lichens and spider webs, and they'll use like petals from pink trees and things like this to put in their nest. Um, I watched them building a nest last year, and uh, it looked to me like both of both of them were working on it, both the male and the female. And um, they would bring up a new lichen and then move one of the old ones. Like, oh, no, I didn't really like that there. <laughs> I just put that there, cause, you know, the day that we moved in. But like, <laughs> so, uh, decorators. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really, really neat to watch a bird build a nest. Especially if somebody is like new to birding or just interested in how that works. Like, what is this language about what a bird call sounds like if you don't actually get to hear a clip? You gave me a great segue. Oh, good. Thank you, Julie. Um, I, I have a few resources here that I think might be helpful for people. So first of all, I would say if you kind of know your feeder birds by sight, but you're interested in getting to learn their songs a little bit better and their calls, um, find out what your top 10 most common birds are and learn those the ones that are there year round, the ones that you see at your feeder. Um, so that's a really good place to start. And you can go, I mean, there are tons of online resources. Uh, the Cornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is is one of the best places to look for. Um, it's basically an online field guide they have, and they have an app as well. So, th- so there are things like that uh, where you can you can hear different recordings. Also, like I said, go to your local Audubon Society and you're going to find somebody like me who is dying to tell you (laughs) the top 10 birds that you should learn. But I do have a book recommendation um, for somebody who's kind of really interested in the language of birds. It's called What the Robin Knows, What the Robin Knows by John Young. That's J-O-N-Y-O-U-N-G. He talks about tracking, the art of tracking, um, where you're... uh, you're listening for not just the birds, but everything, the squirrels and the, the rabbits. And he, he lives in a, a different area from me, but he, he had some other mammals that are involved as well. Um, the deer, uh, everybody's communicating all the time through sound. And if you can tap into that world, then you really start learning a lot. When I read this book, it was just a couple of years ago, and he actually confirmed things for me that I had seen and observed for myself. For example, um, chickadees. I think I think there's some kind of chickadees all over the U.S. Um, and uh, that we have Carolina chickadees here, and they go chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee 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 dee. They say their names. Uh, they have some other noises that they make too, but um, they are always talking. They're just always doing that. They're they're they don't make a lot of noise. It's not a loud bird, but it's always in the background. And they actually warn everybody else, um, all the all the other birds and the mammals, the deer, everybody, um, if there's a predator coming. And they'll say this predator is one of those bipeds that uh, has earbuds and jogging shorts on. (laughs) Probably not much of a threat, but you might want to get out of the way. So like there's one call that says that. And then there's another call that says there's a hawk up there, but it's 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 the kind of hawk that only will kill a bird if it has nothing else to eat. So you're probably okay, but just heads up. And then there are a couple of hawks, at least that we have here, um, that specifically eat birds. And they are super, I mean, amazing predators. Um, You you just have to be in awe of them, even if they're eating your songbirds that you like. Um, And they sail in through the trees just silently, uh, sometimes very close to the the forest floor. This is a, a Cooper's hawk and a sharp shinned hawk do the same thing. And if a chickadee notices a Cooper's hawk, it'll go. It, I don't know if you could hear that. It's this tiny high pitched little noise and everybody gets quiet. It can even be one of those days. This actually happened the other day. Um, there, there was this wall of bird song. Just you couldn't even distinguish anything from anything else. And everybody stopped. I didn't hear the chickadee, but everybody stopped singing, just came completely silent. And I said, where's the hawk? And I looked up and in a few moments, there it was. <laughs> so so uh, this book, What the Robin Knows, tells you 
what you can listen for. And you, it's, there's hardly a learning curve. It's actually very easy. All you have to do is dedicate yourself to it and pay attention. Um, so I highly recommend that book anyway. It, and it comes with some supplemental listening on a website. Um, so uh, he, the birds that he's talking about and the specific sounds that they make, you can actually go and listen to them. Um, you don't have to look that up on your own. So that's a, that's a great resource. You are a trained soprano. Mm-hmm. And this is probably a ridiculous question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most beautiful bird song in your opinion? It's hard to compete with a wood thrush. This is the official bird of the District of Columbia. Also, as of last week in the House of Representatives, also known as Douglas Commonwealth, Washington Douglas Commonwealth, if we become the 51st state, that's going going to be uh, who we are. And I love that. I love, I'd rather be named after Frederick Douglass than um, Columbus. He's got plenty of things named after him. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so, uh, So the wood thrush is related to our... American Robin, which is related to blackbird singing in the dead of night, that blackbird, it's a thrush. And um, all of this type of thrush have a song that sort of goes, it, it, there are a lot of pauses in it. Um, and it kind of goes from down to up. It's like, that, that's a very bad, <laughs> that's, that's like a cat bird imitating. <laughs> um, but you should you should uh, maybe go online and listen to a wood thrush. I don't have any recordings queued up for you today, um, but it is this clear whistle that's uh, interpolated. I guess uh, it interpolated with little um, trills, and there's something very haunting about it. Um, it's it's loud, uh, but it's just it just beckons you to listen to it and they will they'll give you a concert um in fact there's a place very near me just like walking distance but it's in into the national park area um where sometimes if you go in may when the wood thrushes are here there's this like wall of sound uh it's in in music we call it antiphony it's antiphonal singing um so there's one over here and one over here and one over here and they're all singing at the same time um around dusk that's a great time to go listen for them and it it sounds like the aliens are landing I mean, <laughs> but there there is something so haunting about that sound um and one of the things i want to kind of i guess warn about uh, i know that that people especially people in a in different generations from me really like to use apps and those can be so helpful it's a, it's an extremely helpful tool to listen to uh, bird songs online but you can't actually tell the real acoustical qualities of it unless you're hearing it in its natural habitat um, so you'll hear it echo through the trees and it's bouncing off trees and things like that and a lot of the recordings that are online, they're trying to isolate that sound, right? So so that you can learn it. Very helpful tool, but there is no substitute for listening, (laughs) going out and really, really observing it for yourself, because then you can say, oh, that's louder than this bird, but it's less loud than that bird. Um, Yeah, so I'd say a wood thrush is one of the big ones. Um, uh, A house finch, which is a very common bird, I think most people think that it's just twittering um, because it's at an acoustic level that is kind of easy to overlook. It's kind of easy to tune out. But if you listen to that song, there's this rhetoric to it. So a house finch, the the male is this strawberry colored bird. Um, And I guess I'm not sure if they mate for life, but they certainly are always with their mates. And the female is a a brown stripy bird, uh, kind of tan with brown stripes. And this is another bird that's just very cheerful. Um, They sort of bounce up and down to the feeder and they're always talking to each other, very boisterous. Um, And he sings this song that goes the contour of it. It's something like, (laughs) but, but if you listen to it over and over, it's like a complete sentence. There's, there's this rhetoric to it. And I love that song. It's so cheerful. They actually sing through the winter here sometimes, and it's it's great to hear um, any any bird in the winter. Uh, and 
when he is trying to impress the ladies specifically in the spring, he will add an extra octave to his song oh. sometimes when he's displaying. He's like singing and dancing for her. And it is, it's just the best show. It's, it's wonderful. And, you know, there, there are some others that I love, but those are, uh, those are a couple of the big ones. Uh, uh, one that you have to make, you might need to go out somewhere to see. And then one uh, that's always around. What is the most unusual or rare bird that you have observed? I would say one of one of the ones where I felt like I was um, overhearing a secret that I wasn't supposed to mm-hmm. hear was a, um, now, okay, there's several types of these and now it, they've changed the names of some of them, but it was a, it was a um, salt marsh uh, sparrow. I think it's a salt marsh sparrow, salt marsh or seaside. I, my bird people are like having connection fits right now because I can't, but they changed the name of it after I saw anything. So I can't keep up with it. And this is a bird that nests in um, marshes. Uh, I, I was in Delaware when I saw it. Um, and uh, it it was just like, wow, what is that? And the thing is, they don't, they're not super visible. They don't like to be seen. So they will hide down in these marsh sort of weeds and um, you might see the movement of the bird, but you don't actually see the bird. And it actually came out for me and I was able to get such a good look at it. I just took my field notes really quick and then went and poured over the books to see what it was. So that was, that was one, you know, I think also um, when I was in Italy, I was actually visiting Pompeii. I, I was hoping to see this bird and it I actually did get to see it. It was so exciting. My husband was like, what is wrong with you? Um, it's a hoopoe, uh, which is this kind of large, I don't even, I don't actually know that much about them, but you see them in all uh, the, the paintings of the old masters. If you're in like a, a European art gallery, you see these things everywhere. And it's just this large bird that has this sort of rusty orange color and black and white. It's a very prominent bird. And you always see them depicted in art with their crest up. Um, It's got like sort of round things on the top. It's got a big crest. It just looks so exotic. And so this thing lands in front of me at Pompeii and puts its crest up and then just leaves. And I was like, oh my God. So yeah, (laughs) that was pretty cool. and, and even uh, I think pretty much anywhere I go where I know nothing about the birds, I study a lot. I study up and say, OK, this is what I'm probably going to see. But if you go to, to Europe or somewhere uh, where it's a completely different set of birds, it's really every single bird is exciting. You know, <laughs> um, I, gosh, I guess another one would be, be when I was in Colorado um, and saw my first Rufus hummingbird. Uh I was in a, a store where they had hummingbird feeders out and I saw this bird and the guy was like, what's wrong with you? You've never seen a bird before. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus hummingbird is, you can't paint it. I mean, you can't paint a picture of it. There's no way to depict it because of the, the shininess of the feathers. It's just um, uh, the way that they catch the light is just unbelievably beautiful. Um and there it was, you know, this bird, this bird that I've read about in books. Very cool. Are there misconceptions about birding that drive you crazy? I think everything about birders is probably true. <laughs> 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 um, uh, so, you know, we, we probably fit into a lot of stereotypes. If you don't mind my, my twisting your question yeah, just please. a little yeah. bit, on the same day that uh, that. George Floyd was murdered in 2020. There was this incident, this racial profiling incident with Chris Cooper in in Central Park. Um, And this went, you know, it's been all over the world. And that that in part led to uh, Black Birders Week, which is a um, uh, sort of sort of a celebration and awareness campaign, mostly on social media for uh, black bird watchers, black birders. Um, who have felt excluded uh, for many, many reasons, who have been excluded for many reasons. Um, and those are, you know, that that's not anything that I think I have to spell out. But uh, just so you know, hashtag Black Birders Week 2021 is 
May 30th to June 5th. And you should tune your Twitter to all of the amazing, amazing work that black birders and other uh, natural science practitioners are are doing. Um, I don't do Twitter very much at all. I, I kind of started doing it to do shameless self-promotion and the pandemic kind of took a lot of that away because I haven't been doing much. So, um, but every time I tune in, it's just like these, these amazing pictures of birds and <laughs> I've got herpetologists and I've got, um, you know, people who study plants and all, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, it's just great to see what people are doing, but that's just sort of a call to to people like me. I, I identify as white. I'm, I'm I, I've always said I'm an Anglo mutt. We don't really know that much about my family. Um, we're, we're probably mostly from the British Isles um, way back, and uh, and um, it is. I know a lot of bird watchers, a lot of birders. Of all stripes, I know gay people, I know trans people, I know um, Asian people, Southeast Asian people, Asian Americans, I know uh, uh, people who identify as Hispanic. I know one black bird watcher, and I live in Washington, D.C. Mm. Um, so that tells you something about uh, the need for not just, you know, being nice out in the field and being inclusive, but but some sort of dedicated inclusivity and diversity training for bird watchers. I, um, I don't know uh, exactly how we're all going to go about that as a society, but I'm so glad that it's out in the open and that we are all very aware that um, probably all of us have unintentionally um, been sort of exclusive at some point. So, so I hate to twist your question, no, but great. I really wanted to bring that up because um, because it's a it's a serious problem. And I mean, you know, for one thing, um, uh, there's there's economic disadvantage. You, a pair of binoculars costs, you know, a decent pair is three hundred fifty dollars. It, uh, it it ranges from you know a hundred dollars to new Tesla in terms of price. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of things that need to be done on that front. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, if I had to say it was probably what we already talked about, that a lot of people, they think you're just collecting the birds like, oh, I saw that. So now I can move on. I saw that. So now I can move on. And it's so much more than that. Just one final question for you. Which composer do you think gets closest to how you feel about birdsong? Ah, great question. Thank you. So. Uh, Olivier Messiaen, um, French composer, mostly of 20th century, um, wrote specifically wrote bird songs into his uh, into his works, and they're a little tough to get into if you're not a trained musician. I, I say I would say um, they're it's a little niche, <laughs> niche, and he did a lot of work in uh, the Grand Canyon and Bryce Canyon. Um, observing the birds there and noting their songs. Um, I don't know those birds very well uh, because I haven't spent much time. I've not spent any time there. I would like to. Um, and so one of the composers uh, that doesn't have an extensive output in, in bird song, but um, is uh, really, really good at it when she does is Amy Beach. Um, now, I don't have her dates in front of me. I think she died in 1935. Um, she was mostly self-taught. She was a piano prodigy, but she grew up in a sort of waspy family where it wasn't okay for women to do certain things. So she was okay being a piano prodigy until she got a little bit older. And then it's like, okay, you have to get married. So she married a man twice her age. Um, and and he said, um, yeah, you're not going to be a composer. That's not a thing. She said, Mm, well, I mean, I am going to be a composer because I am a composer. But she said, OK, I just won't study at a conservatory or anything. So she was self-taught, um, but a really, really brilliant composer. And I guess I can do some shameless promotion. Um, I did. Please. <laughs> I, I recorded in it came out in 2019. 2020 was supposed to be the year I promoted this album. Oh. Um, I, I did an album called Up Toward the Sky. And it's um, American art songs um, 
uh, s- several, I feature several premieres and um, uh, it's mostly art songs for the 20th century. And art song is generally a song with um, solo voice and piano, uh, usually from an existing poem. So it's poetry set to music. So I do three Amy Beach songs on there. And one is the blackbird. Um, one is the thrush and one is meadowlarks. And in the meadowlark song, she, in the piano, not in the voice, she actually imitates the song of the Western Meadowlark. But she wrote a very, very famous piece of music for piano. It's actually two pieces of music. Um, uh, Hermit Thrush uh, at Evening. Now I can't remember. Hermit Thrush at Evening and and the other one's in the morning, I think. But anyway, it's Hermit Thrush and it has two movements. And she um, basically transcribed the song of the Hermit Thrush on the piano. Uh, The song, I can't even describe how beautiful it is. Um, And... I had only heard them until last month, this month, April. Um, I had only heard them uh, on their breeding grounds in a a lot farther north. Uh, Where did I hear them? I heard them in Colorado and I heard them in um, Oregon. And that's where they breed. But they they actually um, spend winters with us. And so they don't sing in the winter because they're not trying to attract the ladies. But right before... They start moving in the spring. So about the second week of April, sometimes if you're really quiet and still, you can hear them sing. And I did. I heard it twice. This was two weeks ago. And now they're gone. Most for, Probably they're all gone because um, they, they've uh, they've gone to their they're on their way to the breeding grounds. Um very, very special. I didn't even get into bird migration. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, that's, that's one of these, it's a meta phenomenon that, um, you know, you're looking at this little thing and going, what you, you, you were just in the Dominican Republic like two weeks ago and you're here and you're going to Canada. Uh, and it's, you know, it's three inches long. It's just like unbelievable what they do. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, so many, they face so many threats, um, outdoor cats and window strikes and climate change. And I, I, I would say habitat destruction is the one that I've seen the most um, uh, firsthand. You know, people building things where there used to be some trees or a meadow or something. And the birds just, they just go away. Uh, we've lost, North America has lost um, a quarter of its birds since the early 1970s. Oh, my God. And that's billions I can't even remember the the name the number because I I don't think in billions I can't wrap my brain around it. Um, that uh, that study actually came out in I think it was 2019. Uh, how many birds that we've lost and the, the thing is it's preventable and we can change it. We this is there is real real hope here. Um, it's not one of these things where we're just doomed. And I think that. <laughs> maybe maybe you can tell this about me. Um, the the uh, I, the most compelling argument for conservation is just joy and excitement and curiosity, you know, and, and educating people about what is right there if they just pay attention, uh, and some very common sense ways to to help them out. Well, Rachel, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for taking. So much time and being so generous with your time and talking with me today. Oh, likewise. I I, um, I have listened to uh, 
a couple of episodes of your podcast and I love oh, it. Okay. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And um, as soon as bird migration season is over, I'm going to binge oh, listen to all of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That track is called Come Ready and See Me, with words by James Purdy and music by Richard Hundley, performed by Rachel on her album Up Toward the Sky. We also heard Meadowlarks by composer Amy Beach, based on the poem by Ina Coolberth. Rachel's recording is the commercial premiere of the work, and she's accompanied by pianist Jeremy Philsell. You can find Rachel at uptowardthesky.com and rachelbarham.com. Also on Twitter, at uptowardthesky, and on Facebook, at All I Have is a Voice. I'll put all those links in the show notes for you. I'll also include links to Rachel's favorite nonprofits, as well as my own. Also, hashtag Black Birders Week is May 30th to June 5th this year. Just a reminder that you can find this podcast on Instagram at LoveWhatYouLovePod, on Twitter at WhatYouLovePod, and the website is LoveWhatYouLovePod.com. All of the transcripts for Love What You Love are available for everyone on the website. Thanks to Emily White, transcription magician and proprietress of The Wordery. If you need transcripts, reach out to her at emilywhite at thewordery.com. The music for Love What You Love is called Inspiring Hope by Pink Sounds. A link to that artist is included in the show notes. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. Let's hang out again soon. There's some good in this world, Mr. Fertile, and it's worth fighting.